Well, hello, good evening, and welcome to episode 13 of Fracking Nightmare. Sorry, we're um, a little bit on the uh, drag tonight. Had a few technical issues here at Earlham, but we also had a few other issues during the day. I was actually uh, supposed to introduce to you tonight my researcher. Uh, he's a petroleum engineer, and uh, he has a lot to contribute to Fracking Nightmare. But unfortunately, his first visit to Barton Moss also resulted in his arrest, and we'll see that a little bit later. So it's meant that we've had to uh, re-cobble uh, the show together a little bit here uh, latterly this evening. But let's start with some really good news, because earlier today it was announced that Quadrilla, who were responsible for setting off the two earthquakes, or seismic events, if you prefer, on the Fylde Peninsula in April and May of 2013. This is, was the result of the uh, only well to, wells to be fracked in the UK to date. The seismic events in the Fylde Peninsula resulted in damage to properties, not structural damage, but damage to walls, ceilings lifting from walls, door frames coming away from walls, etc. Bathroom tiles cracked. And as it was effectively proven, indeed Quadrilla actually admitted that they were responsible for these seismic events, that resulted in the moratorium on hydraulic fracturing in the UK. Of course, that moratorium was lifted in December of 2012, shortly after Lord John Brown, chairman of Quadrilla, actually announced to the media that he would do whatever it takes to get Britain at the heart of the shale gas revolution. Well, not only was he chairman of Quadrilla, well, he's still chairman of Quadrilla, but of course he was also, and is still also, special advisor to David Cameron's cabinet with a, a special responsibility for business ethos. And for anyone who knows Lord John Brown's background, that is somewhat of an oxymoron. Coupled with which, he's also responsible for uh, being a special advisor to look at ways in which the industry can get kicked off in this country. No vested interest there whatsoever. Huh? Anyway, it was today announced. Here we go. Oh. Let me put that back up on the screen. It was today announced that Quadrilla have withdrawn all of their planning applications for drilling or for fracking in the Fylde Peninsula. And the reason that they have withdrawn these applications is due to uncertainty over the means by which radioactive waste from fracking will be disposed of. Now, this is a potential game changer and show stopper because right from the outset this has been a major issue. When I first met with the uh, Quadrilla management team on the 1st of February last year, so almost exactly one year ago, and I was questioning Francis Egan on this issue and eventually Francis Egan admitted that they did not have a strategy for the disposal of the fracked waste telling me that the game plan was to store it in double skin tanks until such time as a solution was found. Now, when I met with IGAS on September the 17th at the Salford City Stadium at their public meeting, this was last year, and Dave Kerr of IGAS basically stated exactly the same thing, that they didn't know what they were going to do with the fracked waste. But it wasn't going to be an issue for them because they weren't planning on fracking anytime soon. But nonetheless, it is still an issue. 
In the US, of course, this waste is being disposed of in landfill, and it has been proven that in some cases in Pennsylvania, some of the gas companies have been trying to dispose of radioactive waste 17 times above the legal limit. Now, that uh, has been spotted by uh, employees at the landfill sites and the gas companies have been forced to take it back. But what do they do with it then? Because remember, the oil and gas industry in the US has the equivalent of diplomatic immunity when it comes to having to acknowledge or report any contamination of water, soil or air. So this recognition at last that there is no strategy for the disposal of radioactive waste other than to store it in double skin tanks has now come to the fore. So surely it's going to be a little more difficult now for David Cameron and the other banner wavers for the shale gas coal bed methane industry to ramp up the speed with which these companies are going to get their bits in the ground. So this was breaking news today. So let's see what happens over the next couple of days. So more good news perhaps as we go through the show, but uh, let's see how things unfold, be, uh, have unfolded through the week. Because last week the show went out on Wednesday instead of the usual Monday. The reason being is that I had an invitation to speak at the Tameside Women's Institute, that's the other side of Manchester, from uh, Barton Moss. And uh, this was very much a first for me. And I'm very pleased to have uh, at last broken in, as it were, to the Women's Institute. And um, one has, oh, phone's ringing here. And, um, well, that's an interesting call. That was Chris O'Donnell, who we're going to be talking uh, about in just a second. Anyway, um, yes, on uh, Monday, I was speaking at the Women's Institute. And uh, as a result of that, I have now received other invitations to speak at other women's institutes around the country. But um, there is an issue here. And in the last two shows, I have, towards the end of the show, um, raised the issue of funding. Because last year, I drove 42,000 miles in the process of raising awareness about the fracking agenda. I spent uh, 29 of the 66 days at Balkum and have spent over 60 nights under canvas or in the last seven in a caravan that was kindly donated by um, a well-wisher last week. Um, but uh, nonetheless, uh, this is an expensive process. For a lot of people, activism is a hobby. But uh, in my case, uh, with this particular issue, this is my profession. There is no other cause which demands such focus. Because unless we stop this abomination from being established in the UK, then everything else is secondary. This is the first time in my life that I have been this close to the front line of an activist cause. And, well, I'd like to think it's probably the last as well. It's not something that um, falls naturally to me. But uh, this cause does need some support. So I would ask if, if at all possible, if you could uh, take a look at uh, frackingnightmare.com. This is a website that uh, we've set up to be interactive. Um, I would encourage you, if you have interesting articles or information on the hydraulic fracturing process, then please feel free to post them there. But uh, also, I would uh, encourage you to look at the left-hand corner and uh, if you feel able to contribute to the fracking awareness campaign. And this is also to help fund the speakers who are being requested by schools, by universities. And of course, the unfortunate thing is that the industry willingly provides its employees to go and speak to these groups. And of course, the individuals are on the payroll. But for the independent activist or educator, whatever label you want to put, then unfortunately, often, you know, we are left to fund this ourselves. Anyway, Enough of that. I'll leave you to decide whether or not you think this is a uh, cause worth supporting. But back to Chris O'Donnell, because whilst I was speaking at the uh, Women's Institute, or as I was driving to the Women's Institute, Chris was being brutally arrested 
And as we, we saw the full video of the, uh, his live stream leading up to the moment of his arrest and then the audio after the, uh, the, the camera was actually put into his pocket. And on the Wednesday afternoon, I recorded the interview with Chris. So if you want to see that, if you haven't seen that, then look at episode 12 of Fracking Nightmare for the full interview with Chris O'Donnell. Now, Chris has been recovering. He went uh, back up to Scotland for a few days. But uh, this morning, um, he was back at the Barton Moss camp. And I had a brief discussion with Chris. So here's an opportunity to catch up with Chris O'Donnell after his experience of the tactical assault unit of Greater Manchester Police last week. OK, so Chris, it's um, pretty much uh, the one week anniversary of your experience at the hands of TAU. I'm looking forward to half past two. OK, so uh, what's the game plan? Well, now I'm going to head up to court and have these ridiculous bail conditions lifted. I'm here uh, facilitating a protest in that I make sure that everything we do, just like what you do, is live streamed or recorded or noted in a notebook, depending which role I'm covering as a legal observer or doing the live stream side of stuff. You can't do legal observing from the middle of a field. You can't do the video live stream from any way, shape or form of anything constructively in the field when the wind is so heavy like it was earlier on today. And the intimidation brought towards by having many police officers outside the area that I stood next to. And then all the police officers then leaving. And within that uh, couple of minutes after that, the police violently arresting somebody down here. I did desire to come out of the tent that I was at the very back of, the back of the tea tent, which if you look up through the field, you'll see the white tent with its butt coming straight into the field. That is in the uh, field. I'm allowed to be at the back of that tent and not be on the verge, just like I'm allowed to be here. Mm. Uh, we treat these hay bales as being the verge, the end of the verge and the start to the fields. And I generally, generally try and keep down here if there's any truck activity, at least, particularly. So hopefully the bail conditions will be lifted and then you'll be uh, back on the line. Back able to do whatever I need to do. Exactly. Hey, well, good luck. I think we've also um, waiting to hear on the court case today as to whether Barton Moss Road is a footpath or a highway. And of course, the result of that could prove to be a game changer. And also, uh, one of my very close friends, Bear, got arrested today right at the very, very beginning. Well, that was very unfortunate because Bear is uh, actually going to, we're going to be on the uh, Fracking Nightmare tonight. Uh, he still shall be. Uh, well, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, good. Well, that was uh, Chris, and um, I was speaking to Chris uh, after the uh, walk-in of the convoy this morning. Now, there has been some interesting artwork produced after Chris's arrest last week. And uh, this was one that was displayed uh, by the uh, protectors there. Do you have a toxic business interest which needs protecting? Call the TAU. Thugs are us. Well, um, after Chris's experience and after the um, uh, broadcast of his live stream video, I won't say it exactly went viral, but I think it was certainly watched by the uh, Greater Manchester Police. Uh, not least because after I got back from Freckleton, where I was speaking last Wednesday evening, I posted the uh, fracking nightmare edition that had gone out earlier in the evening on the Greater Manchester Police uh, Facebook page. Well, I'm sure somebody uh, probably watched it through the course of the evening because at 8.20 the following morning, the Greater Manchester Police issued a press release. And the press release was uh, the work or attributed to Chief Superintendent Mark Roberts. And he was certainly quoted in that press release. And in that press release, uh, Chief Superintendent Mark Roberts claimed that um, the peaceful protest at Barton Moss had actually morphed into a campaign against the police. And whilst there were peaceful protesters at Barton Moss, he observed that there were people now participating in the protests whose primary intent was antagonism towards the police. Well, I actually don't recall 
ever seeing Chief Superintendent Mark Roberts actually at Barton Moss. So I'm assuming that the Chief Superintendent was issuing his statement purely based on second or third hand reports. But actually, second or third hand reports are totally unnecessary in the realm of policing a peaceful protest because every single day there is an army, a small army of evidence gatherers, police evidence gatherers, whose role is to ensure that there is video evidence of any event occurring during the course of the day. So we have uh, actually put a freedom of information request into Greater Manchester Police to request sight of the footage, which would show that there have been protectors at Barton Moss whose intent has been antagonism towards the police. Well, there certainly has been some repartee between the police and certainly when the TAU are on the front line, there's no question that it is certainly elevated banter. But my suspicion is that the video evidence of people being antagonistic towards the police is going to be about as easy to get hold of as the video evidence of a flare being fired at a police helicopter from the Barton Moss camp. Now, that's a very interesting story in of itself because officially the flare incident occurred on a Saturday morning at around about 12.15. And um, the only problem is that one of the police officers actually told me about a report of a flare being fired at a police helicopter on the Friday morning. So I was either speaking to a psychic police officer or he caught wind of a story that was still being concocted. Because nobody that I've spoken to in Earlham or Caddishead or Pill Green has seen any flare. And a flare is certainly a powerful light in the sky and it would have blinded every CCTV camera within probably a two or three kilometer radius that happened to be pointing towards the Barton Aerodrome. So the, although I have no doubt that there are reports that have been submitted by the uh, police helicopter pilots, which is what I have been told, but um, whether there will be any genuine footage of a flare being fired at a police helicopter from the Barton Moss campaign early on that Saturday morning, I very much doubt. So, Chief Inspector Mark Roberts, before you issue any further statements, may I counsel that you actually insist on seeing the video evidence of the allegations that you are being asked to present to the media so that you are not in danger of actually perjuring yourself at some future date. And the reason I make this observation is because just last week in the court in Brighton, and I'll paraphrase, but the, the judge effectively made the observation that the Sussex police seemed not only to have a poor ability to recall incidents that occurred at Balkham in the summer, but also lacked the ability to interpret what was actually being displayed before them in video evidence because their accounts tended to differ. Mm. So what we're seeing at Brighton is the police's own video evidence collated by their own evidence gatherers effectively derailing a lot of the prosecutions. And you know what? I'm pretty sure that that's going to be the same at Barton Moss. And of course, we're also awaiting the outcome of the determination of whether Barton Moss Road is actually a highway or a footpath. I have a sense that uh, that ruling is going to be delayed for as long as possible to enable IGAS to have their trucks facilitated up Barton Moss Road to the IGAS well site. Now, I did say that um, uh, Bear 
uh, as he is known, was going to be joining me tonight and was going to be my co-host. And uh, I was going to introduce you to him because he will be having a regular input into the show from now on. But uh, like I said, unfortunately, his introduction to Barton Moss was uh, less than auspicious. And uh, we barely made it about 20 meters up the road this morning before Bear was arrested. So let's have a, a quick look at um, Bear being arrested and listen very carefully to Bear's response to the arresting officer. I do not stand under you. I simply uh, acknowledge your request. Okay, on that note, let's take a short break. Sixty percent of the English countryside is under threat from fracking, a process which has transformed the landscape in many parts of the United States and Australia and contaminated the drinking water and air with highly toxic chemicals and gases. One in three hydraulic fracturing was using a carcinogen. So it really is a chemical cocktail that goes into the earth, of which up to 40% remains there. The grandchildren were in the bath and they started screaming and everything that was in the water was burnt. The MDs have been instructed not to report any negative health effects that they believe to be associated with living over a gas field. There's nothing inherent about the shale gas process that is going to lead to problems. Some of this material was actually taken to a large sewage treatment works, which had no capacity to handle radioactive materials of this kind. 800,000 gallons was dumped into the Manchester Ship Canal. 50 seismic events were recorded during just six fracking treatments. What is the minimum depth that the fracking will fracture? We can't tell you until we drill the x-ray. Have you no idea whatsoever? Because it doesn't look like you've done your research. Shale gas is part of the future and we will make it happen. We are just numbers and we are sat on this rich vein of gas and they will do and say anything to get that gas out of the ground. And welcome back to part two of Fracking Nightmare. Now, this would have been the part where I would have introduced you to Bear and we could have talked about his background and some of the research that he's been doing into this particular issue. But it uh, looks like that's going to have to uh, wait for another week. Now, some other interesting things have been occurring at Barton Moss during the course of the last uh, few days. Not least was the fact that during uh, the latter part of the week, one of the protectors decided to build a platform in the trees alongside Barton Moss Road. Now, this seemed to really spook the TAU, and uh, their concern was that this platform might be used as a launch pad for somebody to jump on the trucks. So it was interesting to see how they reacted. They actually cleared a space of about 100 yards either side of the platform and made sure that the road was uh, free of protectors and then got the truck drivers to accelerate past the platform so that it would make it nigh on impossible for anybody to uh, jump on top of the truck from the platform. Well, 
The following day, the following day, the police, in collusion with the owners of uh, Barton Aerodrome, decided to take some fairly drastic action. And unfortunately, the beautiful trees that uh, were along the eastern side of Barton Moss Road are no more. They were taken down, the, uh, the police arrived, the TAU arrived with um, uh, the tree surgeons in tow, and before dawn, they started the process of felling all the trees and subsequently removing all the, uh, the logs and the, uh, the wood chips, so uh, thereby completely opening the side road. Now, there's still a few trees there, um, but uh, for whatever reason, it seems that they've decided that these trees are too far away for anybody to uh, jump from there onto trucks, unless, of course, you happen to be Tarzan. Um, but I don't, haven't seen him over the last uh, few days. Anyway, so the landscape is changing, and not necessarily for the, uh, for the better. But this was the site that uh, greeted people at the weekend. Now, let's uh, just talk a second about the weekend, because the weekend was truly remarkable. We've had two rallies previously at Barton Moss, and both of those have been ostensibly organised by the local community. And the bulk of those attending have been mem members of um, the trade union movements, showing their solidarity with the uh, um, anti-fracking community. But this Sunday was a national rally. And this was a, an event that brought together people from the anti-fracking groups and communities from right across the country. Now, unfortunately, the weather on Sunday morning wasn't that great. It was a cold, wet and, um, and very windy. But uh, on the basis that many of the people coming to the rally had to leave, for example, Brighton at about six o'clock in the morning, uh, they came from South Wales, from Scotland, from uh, West Yorkshire. And by about one o'clock, we had some 15 coaches um, congregating in the Salford Reds parking lot about a mile away from Barton Moss Road. And then some guessing, 750, anything between 750 and 1,000 people or so were then walking along the A57 to the entrance of Barton Moss Road, where there was a rally, where a number of speakers and some music entertainment. Now, this was a great networking day. And of course, apart from the groups from Sussex, there was three coaches from Sussex, and obviously the people that um, were from Earlham and, and Caddishead, uh, they actually started their, their walk a little further away. Uh, they started the walk from the Tiger Moth pub in, in Earlham. And uh, they joined up with the rally at Barton Moss Road. But this was an opportunity for people to compare notes, for people to speak to the Balkan residents and the people that had been at the Balkan camp through the summer and to talk to the people at Barton Moss and to discuss how they could go about making sure that the community in their areas were ahead of the game before the mother frackers actually move into town. Because certainly at Barton Moss, the reality is that the local community, the people of Earlham and Caddishead, were very ill-informed and had very little awareness of what IGAS were planning to do. And of course, this was IGAS's intent to keep as low a profile as possible and to just tick the boxes when it came to consultation. But um, I want to play um, a, a short video. This is uh, Jeff, an Earlham uh, resident. And uh, I spoke to uh, Jeff actually earlier this morning after he had participated in the um, escort of the convoy uh, into the, ca into the uh, iGas well site. And let's have a listen to what Jeff has to say about his awareness prior to the camp moving on to Barton Moss. I'm Geoffrey Baxter and I'm a resident of Erlen. So tell us again, what was the reaction when you told the police that they didn't need to be here? Well, I walked up to the first one and I tapped gently on the side and I said, I'm, I've come from the local area, Erlen on the corner there, I live on Fiddler's Lane and people have just had enough of 
all the heavy handed tactics. There's no need for the police to be here. If we uh, had any problems, I'm sure the residents would come and speak to the camp themselves. But when I went to the next van and I explained to them again, and they just made, remained silent. So eventually I went to the CCTV van, where they were quite talkative and we had a little chat, and they were in full agreement that the police shouldn't be here. You know, if the residents had any problems, I'm sure they'd speak out. Well, the residents don't have a problem with the camp, we know that, because yeah. many of the residents were here yesterday. And of course we, there's a big uh, residence meeting in a couple of days in Earlham. Mm -hmm. um, but they're here of course for one reason, one reason alone, and that's to facilitate getting the trucks in. That's right, yes. You know, they call it facilitating peaceful protest, but yeah. actually it's facilitating yeah. the iGas trucks. But yes, again, I've, I've been here a few times and I have noticed again, the police are quite all right, they're reasonable, they get the job done. But it's the TAU again, running in from the back, pushing through, and that's when all the violence starts. Without them, it's a peaceful process. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, the TAU probably account for about 80% of the arrests, I'm guessing. Yeah, 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 yeah. But you'll come back? I will be here every day when possible, in between work. And because uh, you live just, uh, what, about a mile away or so I from do, here? Yes, yes. So what's, what's your view in terms of the local residents? I mean, are the local residents increasing in their in sort of terms of awareness of what's going on here? Slowly but surely, yes. Yeah, so they can see what's going on, you know, and obviously with YouTube and uh, Truth Ferrix, they've actually been able to see, you know, rather than watching TV, they're actually looking on YouTube and they're actually seeing what's going on in their own area. So I don't know if many are for or many are against until we have a few more meetings. Sure. But it's looking good. But it, and what would you say was the level of awareness before the camp arrived here? No. So the camp, in your opinion, has been absolutely instrumental it's in us. raising awareness amongst the yes. local community? Yes, because it, it, of course when you, you get people that turn up on the mosque and start putting tents up, people are curious to why they are. So. People have come down just to have a look and see well, what you're doing here. So when you explain to them what's going to happen in your own town, the people are saying, well, hang on, we weren't told about this. And then that's when you start asking questions. Absolutely. Well, I think um, this is going to be going on for about another 30 to 45 days or so till I guess uh, vacate the pad. So hopefully the number of local people who realise what's occurring here will increase even more. That's all so. Yeah. Yep. Well, as it happens, I've been invited to speak to the at the AGM of the um, local Labour Party meeting in a week or so. So, you know, although Barbara Keeley has been very consistent in her opposition to this, now at right at the grassroots level, they want to take a little. So that was Jeff from Earlham, just about a, a mile or so away from the iGas well site. Now, you heard a reference there to Barbara Keeley. Now, Barbara Keeley is the Labour MP for the Earlham, Caddishead and Eccles constituency. Now, Barbara Keeley has been con very consistent in her opposition to iGas's presence in the constituency. And my sense is that perhaps a number of people in the constituency, they didn't really take too much interest Barbara Keeley was announcing her opposition and therefore it probably wasn't going to happen. But of course, what we have seen in the uh, Barton Moss uh, um, campaign here is that the views of the local MP actually don't matter a jot. And in fact, Barbara Keeley, like other MPs uh, elsewhere in the country, like Charlie Elphick in uh, Kent and Andrew Tyree in Chichester, uh, both uh, Tory MPs, they state their opposition to the unconventional gas industry in their constituency, but they still support the overall agenda. So in other words, not in my backyard, just in somebody else's. But um, I think that might come back and, uh, and bite them at some point. But we have to learn from this. Now, there was a, a few people, perhaps about half a dozen or so, who were active in looking at the planning applications and um, making freedom of information requests. But what was lacking in Manchester was any real boots on the ground effort in terms of raising awareness amongst the various communities. Now, obviously that has changed very, very significantly over the last few weeks. And we've seen a number of groups established 
and um, and have their meetings. And now, right now, there's a series of uh, film showings going on around the Greater Manchester area, all of which will hopefully contribute to new groups arising. And these groups must be autonomous. This is a critical element of this campaign that each of the groups has to operate completely independent and autonomously so that no group has to ask anybody else's permission. If they have an initiative, if they have an idea, if they have something that they think is appropriate in terms of challenging the industry or challenging the companies coming into their community, then they should have complete freedom to pursue that initiative. The moment there is any hierarchy, the moment there is any clear linkage between these groups, then they are wide open to the infiltration that has occurred in other countries, particularly in Australia, where tragically the Lock the Gate group has uh, been seriously infiltrated and regrettably they were fighting a rearguard action. And um, I have to say, I regret to say that if the anti-fracking community in the UK is as successful as Lock the Gate was in Australia, then we have a serious problem. In southern Queensland alone, there's been over three and a half thousand wells drilled in the last five years. Now, the UK is 100 times more densely populated than southern Queensland. So it's more important, incredibly more important, that we fight this industry and prevent this industry from getting a toehold in this country. Now, I want to close uh, with um, talking about uh, yesterday's uh, rally with um, a short interview with Charles Metcalf. Now, some of you may remember that Charles Metcalf gave a very rousing um, speech at, towards the end of the Quadrilla um, campaign at Balkum in the summer. And of course, Quadrilla were prevented from fracking at uh, Balkum. They basically ran out of time because their planning permission expired on September 28th. And uh, more recently, uh, Quadrilla have announced that they're not planning to frack at Balkum. Uh, Balkum. They're actually going to look for oil in the micrite layer, which is just 33 meters thick. And they're going to use a process known as acid etching, which is otherwise known as fracking. So why are we surprised? Hmm. This is the industry that has a track record of lies, deceit, and obfuscation. And that isn't going to change. And this is another critical element of why it is so important that these local anti-fracking groups are empowered so that within that group, they take full responsibility for monitoring what is going through the local planning authority, any planning applications that are submitted. And we have to do this particularly right now, because if David Cameron gets his way, then all participation by the local authorities will be removed as he makes a desperate bid to get the shale gas industry kicked off in this country. So let's have a look at what Charles Metcalf said to me yesterday morning. Okay, yeah, I'm here at uh, the Salford Reds parking lot with Charles Metcalf from Borkham. Charles, uh, how long did it take you to get here today? Uh, we left about um, half past seven in the, this morning, a bit before, had a couple of wee, wee stops, as the Scots would say, and the English might as well. And um, so here we are, it's taken, us, it's taken us a few hours to get here, six hours or so, but we're here. And I think there's three coaches from Sussex. Three coaches from Sussex, one came from Balkham, you know, Balkham residents and a few people from outlying other, other supporting villages, and a couple came up from Brighton. Fantastic, and I know we've got coaches here from Scotland, from Yorkshire, from Great. Wales. Fantastic. And I think this is the first time that there has been a gathering of all the anti, well, all or many of the anti-fracking communities from around the country. I think you're probably right, and I think it's, it's, I think the reason is that people are now beginning to understand how this government really means what they said they are going to try to do, which is frack two thirds of this country. And we've all been talking to each other, we communities who are under threat, um, who, where, where licenses have already been sold to drilling companies. And we've been trying to spread the word about the dangers, about how to approach the situation they're in, and just help each other. And so this, for the first time, as you say, 
is the coming together of all those different communities, of all their, from all those different people whose, whose beautiful homesteads and villages and environments are threatened to try and resist the general oppressor. So you don't think that uh, too many uh, people are going to be taken in by Cameron's uh, bribery offers of um, 100% of the business rates? That was a real watershed moment. Um, when some one of the government ministers talked about offering compensation. Now, you don't offer compensation unless you've harmed someone. And suddenly you could see light bulbs going on over people's heads uh, all over the country in these communities and people realized that there was going to be harm, there was going to be damage, there was going to be serious disruption to their lives and they suddenly, we moved from this word compensation to bribes bribery. And bribery and that was a real game changing yeah. moment and despite the fact that the industry has tried this week um, to, 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 to short-circuit our thinking and to, to get us away from, from the antagonism that we've shown very consistently by saying, oh, no, no, we're not fracking. No, 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 far from it. We're just doing a little acid etching. You know, no, no, quite hard. Uh, otherwise known hard. as fracking, by, by the way. Otherwise known as a sort of slightly gentle method of fracking and using that well-known household ingredient, as they kept on telling us at the beginning of the thing, your, things you'll find in your kitchen or your bathroom, that well-known household so degree hydrochloric acid not in my kitchen or my bathroom and even if it was you wouldn't be pouring it into your kettle anytime soon i wouldn't be pouring it in my kettle and pouring it down a hole in the ground where it might bubble up again nastily in my river exactly exactly well charles it's going to be a great day here i know there's going to be some wonderful networking going on and oh, um Let's just hope the rain holds off There's for a while. There's a hugging at the moment, but I suppose the networking comes later. Absolutely. Or maybe that is modern networking. Maybe it is. Hey, yes. let's embrace it. Thanks. No pun intended. <laughs> Thanks, Charles. Well, that's Charles Metcalf. Um, and, uh, of course, Charles was one of the uh, uh, groups who came up from Sussex for the day. So they endured about 12 hours in the, in the coaches. And uh, it was a wonderful day. Now, later on in the, uh, in the day... Uh, Vanessa Vine, who has been uh, one of the leading campaigners uh, in Sussex, in fact, the founder of Frack Free Sussex and uh, Britain and Ireland Frack Free, and uh, she did a, an interview on Channel 4. Now, the interview was a live interview, but Vanessa was at uh, Barton Moss, and um, the person that she was up against in the Channel 4 studio was none other than Peter Lilly. Now, Peter Lilly is the MP for Hitchin and Harpenden, in, uh, just to the north of London. Now, this is not the first time that Vanessa has come up against Peter, and I would love to play the interview for you, but uh, I don't want to run the risk of Channel 4 claiming copyright on uh, the YouTube uh, of um, this edition of Fracking Nightmare. So I'm simply going to encourage you to search for Vanessa Vine, Peter Lilly, Channel 4. That's all you need to... Um, to put into your search engine, and you can watch this seven-minute exchange between Peter Lilly and uh, Vanessa Vine. And Vanessa comes pretty much straight out of the uh, the blocks and points out that uh, Peter Lilly is, um, uh, how should I say, having a casual relationship with the truth. Oh, actually, no, she said he was lying, and and of course he was. But uh, Peter Lilly's performance was exactly what you would expect to see of these politicians. In fact, I have to say, this is a screen grab from the, um, uh, the debate. And you know, the look on his face there, I mean, it's the look of absolute thunder. And he was way out of his depth. The bottom line is that the guy was lying through his teeth. And Peter Lilly would absolutely not have the courage to participate in any live debate open public debate on this subject. In fact, Peter Lilly would have about as, uh, as much intention of participating in any public debate as would Francis Egan or Andrew Igas or anybody else from the industry because they know, they know that once people look at this for themselves and understand the damage that this industry causes, it is not possible for them to be supportive. So watch that uh, discussion and, um, 
and, or you'll get uh, an idea for yourself as to, you know, really how low the government and its spokespeople have uh, resorted in trying to push this agenda. And of course, you know, the bribery, as we've said, uh, Charles uh, Metcalf um, acknowledged that this should really get the alarm bells ringing, that 100,000 that was on offer to the communities that embraced the unconventional gas industry, they wasn't going to cut it. So now the bribery has been up to 100% of the business rates and 1% of the revenue. Well, let me assure you that 1% of the revenue will be minuscule because I know just as well as everybody else in the international oil industry how you can manipulate the accounts of one legal entity so that you minimize your exposure in terms of whether it's taxation or paying your 1% uh, levy to the local community. So anybody banking on that is going to be very, very disappointed. But, you know, this is behavioral adjustment payments. The oil and gas industry and the British government work on the basis that everyone has their price because this is their mentality. They have a price. They've sold their soul. And it's just a question of establishing what the price is amongst those communities. Now, some communities, some local authorities have immediately responded by saying, forget it. We're not interested. But of course, as I've said already, David Cameron is working to try and remove them from the equation. And it wouldn't surprise me at all if Quadrilla's um, public withdrawal of their applications is no more than a token gesture, just like Gerwin Thwellin Williams making a big point of withdrawing his planning applications from Somerset and from Kent. They're waiting for David Cameron to invoke the Growth and Infrastructure Act, which passed into law in April last year, which gives Cameron the power to remove all local authorities, all county authorities from the equation in the event of something being considered to be so important that it's essential to the well-being of national security, national energy security, or the well-being of the economy. And no doubt Cameron is going to claim that the shale gas industry fits at least two, if not all three of those. So now let's um, just have a look at uh, some upcoming events here. Um, I'm going to be doing a, uh, a talk in Chawton. Now, <clears throat> as it so happens, uh, this was something that I, I wanted to be doing uh, some time ago, but it was actually very difficult to get it off the ground for varying reasons. <clears throat> so it's a month away, and um, it's the title of the talk is To Be or Not To Be Totally Fracked. And uh, this is going to be at the Chawton Ir Irish Club in uh, High Lane, Chawton. It's about a month away on the 26th of February. And this is going to be one of a number of dates around the country. And I'm going to be focusing on areas that are being targeted by the unconventional gas industry because we absolutely have to do everything we possibly can to avoid a repeat of what happened in Manchester, where basically nobody really knows anything about what's going on until the protection camp starts to arrive and then people start to get curious and then look at it for themselves. We need to be ahead of the game. And then another event that's uh, coming up later in the, uh, in the year at uh, um, Staverton Park. In fact, Staverton Park in Daventry is pretty much right in the centre of the country. Um, that, that's uh, assuming that the uh, M62 is a northern boundary. Uh, but for 80% of the population of England, um, Daventry is effectively right in the centre. And this is going to be a three-day event. And this event is aimed at people who really want to participate in changing the game. 2014 is the year that humanity is going to take on this insanity. And when we nail the issue of hydraulic fracturing, and we will, David Cameron, in my opinion, is already starting to consider an exit strategy because 2014 is the penultimate year before the election. The election has to be called in May 2015 at the absolute latest. David Cameron is desperate to try to establish this industry before the hustings start in the run-up to that election. 
The reality, Mr Cameron, is that this issue could potentially lose you and any other party that supports the unconventional gas industry the election. So the reality is that wherever you try to get your bits in the ground in the coming year, there will be a protection camp and there will be a rising awareness of the people in the local community. And because the political process is bankrupt on this issue, because it was not part of any manifesto, you tried to slip it in under the radar. There is no social license. You know there is no social license. And you know, ultimately, that you are going to have to retreat. And the only issue is whether you can do it gracefully. Somehow, I doubt that. But um, it's a very interesting year. What is also very interesting is the increasing number of Manchester police who are letting it be known that they are supportive of the protection camp. But nonetheless, they have a job to do, unfortunately. Some do it with more fervour than others, perhaps. But um, nonetheless, you know, the camp is serving its purpose. It is helping to raise awareness, not just in the local community, but around the rest of the country. And every time the TAU come on the front line, it helps raise that awareness. And I have to say, I have to say that given the preference for peaceful protest, then that would undoubtedly be mine and every other Barton Moss resident's preference. But the reality is, in your quest to save iGas, just a few minutes on the delivery of their trucks, the TAU come out and the TAU get very, very heavy handed. And it provides fantastic footage in terms of getting the word out. Tragically, this country and probably many other countries thrive on sensationalism and peaceful protest doesn't necessarily generate sensationalist footage, but the TAU guarantee that we get it. And today, with the eight arrests, it was no different. And, well, let's see what happens in the coming days and weeks. Because the reality is the camp is there for the duration. I guess are behind schedule. They're going to be drilling for something in the region of another 30 to 45 days, which means that the Barton Moss campaign is going to probably be in excess of 100 days compared to Balkham's 66. And this is certainly more almost about double what IGAS were originally intending. But who's bearing those costs? Who's bearing the costs of the delays and the costs of the policing? Well, right now, I'm sure it's the taxpayer for the policing and it's the investors for IGAS. Meanwhile, of course, Andrew Austin and some of the other members of the leadership team make out like absolute bandits as they artificially hike the stock price. Andrew Austin, in the 10 days after the announcement that Total were buying into the UK shale gas industry, Andrew Austin yielded a net increase of £5.1 million just in his stock holding. £5.1 million was probably close to the total annual income of the housing estates adjacent to the Barton Moss well site. This will make a few people very wealthy. But the reality is that if this industry gets a foothold in this country, we will be condemning future generations to lives of absolute abject misery. Now, for those of you who can't get to Barton Moss, we want to be able to give you the full experience of what it's like to be on the front line. And so later on this evening, we will be uploading to my YouTube channel, to that's uh, Ian R. Crane, to my YouTube channel, the full video, the full unadulterated video. Each one's about 40 odd minutes long. This is the walk up of the convoy. And then after the trucks have unloaded at the iGas well site, the walk down. So this is about as close as um, I can get you to the experience without you actually being there. But as is always the case, boots on the ground are always welcome. So if I don't see you at Barton Moss, hopefully see you next week for Fracking Nightmare, episode 14. Take care. Good night.